better discipline. But, um, what I plan to do is is write on here. Um, so if you're sitting over on the edge or up high, it might be better to come down a little bit lower. Um, I don't have um, <clears throat> great confidence in my ability to um, to remember what to erase on black books. And so what I what I so the the uh, the slides are intended to accompany the um, uh, the the uh, material on the blackboard whiteboard. Um, So that if I, so that when I erase something that I shouldn't, I can actually go back in the slides and we can, uh, we can see it. Um, now, yesterday, Emre said something very nice about coding and information theory. Uh, he said that um, at the beginning of time, there was not a lot of distance between coding and information theory and people like Burlikamp and Massey in both. And that over time we have become more specialized and the fields have diverged. And one of the nice things about polar codes is that they come back together. Um, so this morning I'm going to talk about measurement, broadly defined. And the first 90 minutes is Uh, like Sid said, it's a, it's a, um, it, it, it's background for uh, for shadow lecture, and it's about it's about measurement. It's about it'll actually end up being about quantum measurement, and the the uh, the, the the second half will be a little bit unrelated to the first. It'll be about machine learning and wireless communication and how you can make the world. There's time, and there's frequency. And there's a Fourier transform that exchanges the notion of both time and frequency. And I want you to have this picture in the back of your mind as I try and create a parallel universe for you. And it's this parallel universe is going to be a way of introducing read Muller codes. And it's going to be a way of introducing read Muller codes that makes a connection between the binary world and the real Euclidean world. Which um, I think is interesting for uh, uh, many reasons. All right, so we'll, we'll, we're going to spend about 30 minutes at least um, making friends um, with, with, uh, with these two matrices and the group that they generate uh, by, by Kronecker problems. Um, so let me, in advance, give you a little picture of the quantum world that's to come. So, in the classical world, we have classical bits. And classical bits are very classical. They can only take two values, 0 and 1. Quantum bits are different. So a quantum bit is a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And you have two base states, which I'll call E sub 0 and E sub 1. And your quantum bit can be in any superposition of these two states. Now we only consider 
unit vectors, so alpha squared plus beta squared is 1. So when you look at that matrix X, you can think of that as acting on this two-dimensional Hilbert space. You can think about it acting on a quantum bit. You can think of the rows and the columns as being indexed by E0 and E1, or more simply as by 0 and 1. And what X is doing is it's doing a bit flip. It's exchanging those two states. If you look at the matrix Z, and you interpret rows and columns in the same way. What that's doing is it's changing the relative phase of E0 and E1. So you can think of that diagonal matrix as So with quantum bits, the problem with a quantum bit is that you can, you can make a quantum bit in this state, but it doesn't stay in that state. Because wh however you realize your quantum bit, maybe you realize it in terms of spin states of some beryllium ion or something like that, it interacts with the environment. And what hap what, the way that that interaction happens is that the environment applies these matrices X and Z to it. So as, as time evolves, the state that you think you made, it changes. And in quantum error correction, what we're going to want to do is to protect a quantum qubit so that we can rely on the superposition. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, quantum stuff as we, um, as, as the lecture progresses. Um, <clears throat> in this slide, what I'm doing is, I'm trying to be very simple about the, uh, so the, this, the, there's this motivation for X and Z in the background. These are, if you're a physicist, these are Pauli matrices, and you see them all the time. Um, <clears throat> Here, what I've done is I've realized these two Pauli matrices, X and Z, just as symmetries of the square. Um, symmetry group of the square is the dihedral group D4. Um, and it's generated by these two matrices, X and Z. So let's just think about X. X is, uh, it squares to the identity. It's actually a reflection in the line B1 see that that's true. And of course, the, the eigenvectors of x, that, well, that's just the coordinate frame, b1, b2. Um, x fixes b1 because of your reflection in b1, and it negates b2. So x is, it's a matrix of order 2 squares to the identity. That means it's got two eigenvalues, one and minus one. And it's got one, it's got a one-dimensional eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue one, and another one-dimensional eigenspace corresponding to the value minus one. Uh, Z also squares to the identity. It also has two eigenspaces. They're just the standard coordinate vectors, A1 and A2. And um, it fixes A1 and it negates A2. Now, the most important property of these Pauli matrices is that they don't commute. In fact, they anti-commute. What that means is that xz equals minus zx. And that's very important. Now, this slide, of course, has a deliberate mistake. Anyone see the deliberate mistake?
Actually, it wasn't a deliberate. It was a, it was a mistake that I discovered after I made the slide. <laughs> now, in the, in the Fourier world, I said we have time and we have frequency. And we have this transform, the Fourier transform, that exchanges the two. Now, in my binary world, I'm going to want to have something that plays the role of the Fourier transform. And it's going to be this walsh hadamard transform, H2. And if you look at H2, you can see that if you square H2, you get the identity. So the deliberate mistake, of course, is that it can't represent rotation through pi by 4 because it would have the wrong order. It is actually rotation through pi by 4 followed by reflection in B1. And that gives it order 2. And if you look at H2 and you apply it to the two coordinate frames, A1, A2, and B1, B2, you can see that it exchanges the two. So I'm going to want to think of x as my notion of time. So I'm going to want to tell you what a time shift is in the binary world. And I'm going to want to think of z as something that's happening in frequency. It's a phase change. And I'm going to want to relate the, uh, the, the, the two of them. Um, something that's going to be very important, it's a very simple fact, but it's very important, is that um, if I have a vector v, and I apply x to it, and, um, and, I, and I know that v is an eigenvalue of x, What can I say about this factor? I'm going to say that um, um, this, by the way, is nothing more than Z, because that was the property of H2 when you uh, when you conjugate x by h2, you get z. When you conjugate z by h2, you get x. So here, this is just lambda x h2. So over here, you have, you have x, and you have two eigenspaces, one corresponding to 1, one corresponding to minus 1. You have this transform, H2, which interchanges time and frequency. Mathematically, when you conjugate x by H2, um, uh, you, get, uh, you get z. And um, when you uh, conjugate z, I see that I can't decide not to connect. <laughs> well, maybe I can. All right. So, so you've got you've got an eigenvector of x with a certain eigenvalue, and when you apply h2, you pass from one coordinate frame to the other, and you pass from an eigenvector 
with eigenvalue lambda for x to an eigenvalue, an eigenvector for z with the same eigenvalue. So <clears throat> going to see this picture a number of times where on the left hand side we have a coordinate frame and we have some transform and it's going to take our coordinate frame and produce another coordinate frame. And translation, so applying the transform to vectors, takes you from one coordinate frame to the other. The coordinate frame is for a matrix or for a group. And you get from one group to the other by just conjugating. So this is exactly what happens in the Fourier domain, where you have time shifts and you have frequency shifts. And when you conjugate a time shift by the Fourier transform, you get a frequency shift. So, the, um, <clears throat> so this is this is our uh, our, our binary our binary uh, Fourier world. So, what is a time shift in the binary world? Well, I want you to, to look at x. We were labeling the rows and columns of x with 0 and 1. And the time shift is going from 0 to 1 and from 1 to 0. So it's basically adding 1 modulo 2. So in my binary world, time shifts are going to be adding a binary vector to an index. So we're, let's develop that a little bit more. Ah, <laughs> you are going back and forth here. Just like, okay. All right, so we, we did, we, we, I hope we properly motivated um, single quantum bits. Now, when, if, we, if we're ever able to build a quantum computer, of course it's going to have more than one quantum bit. And we're going to need to be able to describe the state of a quantum computer with m quantum bits. And we do that by taking Kronecker products. So a quantum bit is a two-dimensional Hilbert space. If we have m quantum bits, that's going to be a two to the m dimensional uh, Hilbert space. And instead of having um, two states, we're going to have states that are indexed by binary vectors v. v is just telling you about the state of each of the individual quantum bits. And we're going to have a notion of a pure state, which is just some sum over uh, the, the binary vectors v. And we're going to have that the sum of the squares is 1. So, that's, so when we talk about quantum computing, we're going to have to go from a single qubit to multiple qubits. And when we do that, we're going to have to go from a two-dimensional Hilbert space to a two to the m-dimensional Hilbert space. So let me tell you how that works. So we do this by means of Kronecker products. And here, what's the Kronecker product of a matrix X and a matrix Y? Well, it's, it's here. Uh, you write down the entries of the matrix X and you multiply each of them by the full matrix Y. So very simple. Uh, proposition is that Kronecker products multiply together in the way that you would hope they multiply together. That is to say, uh, you take the components, you multiply the components together, and then you take the, uh, the Kronecker product of those, uh, of those, um, those products. Now, um, we're going to, to, to prove this in the engineering way by, by doing it for the 2 by 2 case and convincing you that the general case isn't really any different. 
And so here we are. We've got uh, uh, this is x chronicle y. This is x prime chronicle y prime. And we calculate the top left entry. There we've calculated it. And we just stare at that. And we collect together the coefficient of y1 prime. And we discover that it's just the 1 1 entry of xx prime. So Kronecker products behave properly. Now, we have this little 2 by 2 Hadamard matrix H2. And we can make a big Hadamard matrix, 2 to the m by 2 to the m, by just Kronecker-ing up m copies of that. And so, <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is describe for you. So, actually, I'm not. I'm going to uh, do this. Um, this is designed to, to build your intuition about. Um, <clears throat> so, here we have these matrices X and Z. And I'm going to make something called the uh, Heisenberg Weyl group, which is Kronecker products of X and Z. So here's just a little bit of intuition. Uh, can you make these matrices as Kronecker products of these guys? Perhaps I should also say that xz is um, 0 minus 1 plus 1 0. So I use minus and plus as shorthand for minus 1 and 1. So um, anyone tell me what, they, what that's a chronic product of? It's, it is something cross something. So what, what are the two question marks? But, no, it's terrible that the, that the person with the worst voice in the audience has to have. So you look at this matrix here, and you, uh, you are, it's, it's divided into halves for you. And you see that the bottom left half is the same as the top right half. And that's a clue that this is x. Because you see the top right half of x is the same as the bottom left half. And then what is that 2 by 2 matrix in each of the two halves? It's just xc. And the others are just as, just as easy. slides, or the next slide or so, is, um, is, is we are um, <clears throat> getting a little closer to, um, to, to, to time shifts. Um, but first of all, I, I want to um, to to um, to to um, to to, to uh, label the standard coordinate vectors in uh, in a particular way. So I'm going to I'm going to have these vectors, and they have two to the m entries. And I'm going to label each of the entries with a binary interval. And I'm going to order them from left to right. So 
for E0 and E1. <coughs> 1. That, that coordinate vector is 1, 0, because the, the leftmost entry, the entry that's a 1, that's in position 0. So the left entry is labeled by 0, and the right entry by 1. So E1, of course, is 0, 1. Now, <clears throat> let's think about E1, 0. So that's, a, that, that, that's binary notation for 1. So the leftmost entry is 0, and the next one is 1. So I've got to think about how I make the vector 0, 1, 0, 0 as a Kronecker product of E0 and E1. And you can see that um, it's E0, Kronecker, E1. Uh, let's do a vector of length 8. So let's look at um, E011, so that's notation for 6. So we go along from the left to the right, and we count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So it's 1 from the end on the right, that's a 1. Now, how do we make that guy as a Kronecker product to be 0 and E1? Well, I assert that it's uh, that it's uh, zero one Kronecker zero one Kronecker one zero. Um, let's just un unwrap that. It's if we look at this guy, that's zero zero one zero. And then when we apply this, we'll get four zeros at the beginning, and then we'll get this vector. Okay? And you can, you can see a pattern emerging. And the pattern, of course, is that you take the binary index that you're trying to make, 0, 1, 1, and you turn it around, and you do E0, E1, E1. Okay? That's the uh, that's the. And if I gave you the exercise of showing that the standard coordinate vector EV was evaluated by this Kronecker product, then I think that you'd all know how to do that. I mean, the natural way to do that is to prove it by induction. And um, <clears throat> after the inductive step, there's just uh, two possibilities for the, for the next step in the case. Remember that um, when we were looking at the, uh, the, this matrix X, which was 0, plus, plus, 0, we were thinking of uh, rows and columns as being indexed by 0 and 1. And we were thinking of this as being just addition of 1 modulo 2. going to um, take a binary amptable, and I'm going to define a 2 to the m by 2 to the m matrix, which I'll call DA0. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, the, the A0s, they're just going to give you powers of this x. So of course, if x0 is 0, you just get the identity. And if x0 is 1, you get the matrix X. And so here I've given two examples, 1, 1, 0, 0, and 1, 0, 0, 0. So this, uh, <clears throat> so 1, 0, that rightmost thing gives you the identity on the left-hand side, and then you've got an X. And so here you have these two matrices. And, um, yeah? I think that's implicit if you want. 
the exercise, I think, is not V cross A, but V plus A. Yes, it should be V plus A, exactly, yes. So if you, if you look at these two things, um, these matrices, they're permutation matrices. And if you ask yourself, how do you describe that permutation? Well, if you look at the top one, what you've done is you've added the binary vector 1, 1 to each one of the row, each one of the row indices. So that top matrix is describing addition by 1, 1 modulo 2. And the bottom one is addition of 1, 0 modulo 2. So when you make your time shift with these x's, when the exponents are 1, that's telling you that you're going to add a 1 in that position. And when it's a 0, you're not going to add anything at all. So this is, so binary time shifts, this is what they're going to be. So the exercise is to formally prove that. And the way that you formally prove it is just to unwrap everything. So DA0 is a tensor product, is a Kronecker product. EV is also a Kronecker product. So when you're evaluating this guy, just write everything inside as a Kronecker product, and then just work out what happens to the components. Each component is just E0 or E1 applied to X or I2. And so by, unwrap, by, by checking that the components behave properly, you can just prove that. So these are time shifts. Frequency shifts work in exactly the same way. So here, you're given a binary vector B0 through Bm minus 1. And the, the components of the binary vector tell you about the exponents of the Zs that you're going to use in the Kronecker problem. And here I've just done uh, a couple of examples. 0, 0, 1, 1, and 0, 0, 1, 0. And here the exercise is to make sense of the entries on the diagonal. And uh, the claim is that um, if you apply this diagonal matrix to the standard coordinate vector EV, then this is the answer. And the way that you prove that is to just unwrap everything. So this is a Kronecker product. That's a Kronecker product. Write them both out, multiply them together coordinate-wise, put it all back together. You can see that this BV transpose, that's just summation BIVI. And the individual terms BIVI come from the individual entries of the Kronecker product. So that works. Now, <clears throat> you've, you've understood what these DA0s and D0Bs are. Um, the, the Heisenberg Weil group is just composed of scalar multiples of these DABs. So DAB is just DA0 times D0B. And the Heisenberg Weil group is all scalar multiples, the DABs, and the scalar multiples are just plus or minus 1 and plus or minus i, where i is the square root of minus 1. And we'll talk a little bit about why you need i in, uh, in a minute. So, so here I've got, I've got a group in the real world and it's indexed by binary vectors A and B. And the binary vectors are basically a recipe for putting the matrix together. The, the index A tells you where the x's go, and the index B tells you where the z's go. 
So if we look at this particular example, we start from the right-hand side, where the rightmost entries are, Z, are 0 for A and 0 for B, that corresponds to an identity of the leftmost side. And then we have a 1 for A and a 1 for B, oh, that's an XZ. And then a Z, an X, and an XZ. That's how we put it together. Now, if I want to go back to Fourier analysis, you know that when you put classical time shifts together, like cyclic time shifts and the corresponding frequency shifts, and you say, I'm going to just look at those as matrices, what group do they generate? It's a Gabor group of some kind. This is a binary Gabor group, but it's actually much more interesting than the classical ones, and I'll try and explain why. The first thing is you, you want to know how, how do these elements in the group, how do they multiply together? And this is a group of matrices that's trying really hard to be a vector space, but it's just not quite making it. So what I claim is that if you multiply DAB by DA prime B prime, this is what you get. And the way that you prove that is just the way that we were doing everything before. You extend, you expand everything in sight as a Kronecker product. And then you look at each component. And you remember that X and Z anti-commute. So if we look at that Jth component, what we really want to do is to pull this x a j primed through that z b j. But to do that, because x and z anti-commute, we have to pay a penalty minus one if b j and a j primed are one. So this term down here. A primed B transpose. That's just the result of pulling all of those terms through. So when we multiply DAB by DA prime B prime, we get we get we get another DAB, and the the the, the entries are just the, the binary sums of the A terms on the left-hand side and the binary sums of the B terms on the left-hand side. But there's this phase factor, minus 1 to, to some uh, exponent. And if you multiply these two things the other way around, then instead of getting an A prime B transpose, you get an A B prime transpose. And that tells you that if you multiply two of these things one way around, it's like multiplying them the other way around with that phase factor. So if you're a mathematician and you look at that, that's actually a symplectic in a product. The other thing to note is that um, if you look at that second exercise there, where you're multiplying these DABs together, suppose that there was the same DAB, so that A primed was A and B primed was B. Then over on the right hand side, you'd have A plus A primed, which is zero, and B plus B primed, which is zero. So when you square an element, you either get the identity, or minus the identity. So everything in the group has ordered 2 or 4. Now, everything's a permutation matrix, or well, a signed permutation matrix. So if you're a signed permutation matrix, and you square to the identity, then you're symmetric. You're a permutation of order 2, you're symmetric. If you square to minus the identity, you're skew symmetric. 
And actually, the reason that we have the eyes in here is that for quantum computing, we're going to want Hermitian matrices. So whenever we have one of these things of order four, so where the DAB squares to minus the identity, we're going to want to multiply it by I to get a Hermitian matrix. So that's the reason why the I's are there. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the group. And <clears throat> so it's always good in these lectures, in any lecture, for the uh, for, for the speaker to say something that he doesn't really understand, right? So this is something to um, well, I should I'll do that. I'll say something that I don't understand in just a moment. Before I, uh, <laughs> let me say a few more things that I do understand. Um, this Walsh had a mod matrix. Um, there's all that I want to get out of this slide is that the, the rows of the walsh hadamard matrix are like the rows of the Fourier transform, right? They're, they're DFT uh, rows. And, um, and they have a very simple form. The, the, the rows of this matrix can be indexed by, um, by just binary vectors. So, you have the bth row and the vth position, and the entry is minus 1 to the BB transpose. There's all sorts of different ways to prove that. You can prove it using the group. Or you can just set up a, an induction proof, because if you, if you think about H2 is just plus, 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 minus, and H4 is H2 H2, H2, minus H2, so on. You can see that you could set up an induction proof to just prove that. Now, to, to continue to make the, the analogy with, uh, with Fourier, If you think about time shifts, what are the eigenfunctions of time shifts? The eigenfunctions of time shifts are sinusoids. So what are the sinusoids in the binary world? Well, the answer is that they're the rows of the walsh hadamard matrix. And let's think about that. So here, and here I I'm going to use the Fourier transform notation, EB hat. That's just the, the B row of the walsh hadamard matrix. And so what it is, is just that expression there. You run product, you multiply them together, and you get the, uh, you get the answer. And if you look at these Walsh functions, actually, if you, if you choose your Walsh function properly, you can make them look like sinusoids. So here, these two particular ones, you can look at those and they say, yes, those are sinusoids. They go up and down, and one goes up and down more frequently than the other. So, um, that's the picture. So, this is the binary counterpart for e-analysis. <coughs>